Thank you. I almost forgot to grab the microphone. I was just about to, hello, I was just about to start talking because you guys are awesome, but then I realized I should probably speak into the microphone. Um, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks to all of you for being here. I'm super excited. Um, I'm gonna get right in because I figure you guys are here for her, so let's do it. Um, what made you want to write this book? Oh boy, we are getting right to it. Getting uh, right to it. <laughs> so we got a lot um, to get to. I, in 2013, uh, I was a graduate student at, at Harvard. I had, I had left Chicago. I had left my job as a Chicago public school teacher to go to graduate school, um, largely because I wanted to understand the systems outside my classroom that made life harder for me and my students and my colleagues. Um, so I had gone to graduate school to try to understand more about CPS beyond the walls of my own classroom. And uh, I, was, I was visiting my father on spring break and uh, the school closures, as some of you may remember from that time, it wasn't like one neat and clean announcement. It was a wave, a year of uncertainty and, and confusion. Um, but when the final list came out, I saw that the school that I had, that I had taught at was on the list. Um, and I started to uh, read the things that Barbara Bird Bennett, who was the CEO at the time, um, was saying about the justification for the school closure. And it didn't, didn't really pass the smell test, right? It didn't pass the sniff test for me. It just didn't make sense. And I got tired of people asking me, uh, my colleagues asking me in graduate school, you know, why is this happening and, and what's happening? And I, I didn't know the answer. I didn't have a good answer. So I became obsessed with uh, finding out. And uh, five years later, I, here's this book. Like a good little researcher, you dug right like in. Like an obsessive, <laughs> crazy person, yes. <laughs> We're going to get more to that later on. Um, you start with a focus on diet high school. Explain why you wanted to focus on that school specifically. Yeah, so um, diet, for those that don't know, um, is it, it was originally a middle school, actually, that our, that our uh, kind opening presenter, uh, Cheryl, actually attended when it was a middle school. Um, so Walter H. Diet High School is in Bronzeville. It's on 51st and King Drive. It's a few blocks away from President Obama's house. And uh, Jean-Claude Brizard, who was the CEO before Barbara Bird Bennett, had announced that the school was going to phase out. And so what that meant was they were going to stop adding new high school students, and every year as students would leave, they wouldn't be replaced. So you can think about what that does kind of psychologically if you're attending a school and you know that your school is closing in, in a few years, um, what that does in terms of the resources that are available, the teachers, many teachers left, many students left. Um, and community members said, this is our open enrollment high school and we'd like to keep it this way. And so um, they staged a 34-day hunger strike um, in response to the proposed closure of diet. And um, it was a really amazing moment because it was a, a moment where there was a, it was the first time that it seemed like there was a possibility of CPS reversing a decision about a school closure. Now the hunger strike um, was, was a really amazing and devastating um, a, a act of social direct action and social change and organizing. And the folks who participated in the hunger strike said that they only ended it because they realized that the mayor was going to let them die. They truly, they felt and they had every uh, available piece of evidence to suggest that he was going to let them die. Um, some folks were hospitalized. One person, I attended a Chicago Board of Ed meeting where a person um, fainted in the middle of the meeting, was taken out by uh, an ambulance. The board kept going, continued to meet. Um, and uh, that led people to think, you know, am I really willing to die for this school? Um, so it was a really heart-wrenching and shocking and jarring story. Um, and Walter H. Diet High School today is open. Open. And it is, a, it is a high school for the arts, and it's named after Walter Henry Diet, who was not a famous person, not a celebrity, not a politician, um, but he was a music educator in, in Bronzeville um, who trained people like, um, like Nat King Cole and Dinah Washington. And so um, I think it's a really important symbolic story. And for clarity, with regards to the school closures, there was that list of nearly 50 schools. Right. Those were all elementary schools. Correct. Diet High School was a separate closure. So these are two different, two different stories that, that she's getting into in the book, just so everyone knows. Um, the, the hunger strike, though, it seems like such a drastic form of protest. Um, what does that say to you that the protesters felt they needed to go that far? You know, we don't, um, so Chicago is a profoundly undemocratic city. 
Um, and we live in a sort of autocracy in many ways. Um, it's been that way for a long time. We used to live under a long-standing benevolent dictatorship, and now we live under a different sort of autocratic rule, right? Um, the mayor appoints the person who runs the police. The mayor appoints the person who runs public housing. The mayor appoints uh, the superintendent of schools. The mayor appoints every board member who runs the schools. We are the only district in the state of Illinois that does not elect our uh, own school board. We can vote for the people who run the water reclamation district, right? We can vote for judges, but we can't vote for the people who make the decisions um, that dictate the lives of our children and their experiences in schools every day. And so, um, by the time you get to a hunger strike, that's the end of a long line of meetings, letters, petitions, um, efforts to get people's attention and power. And there's very little uh, pressure or responsibility that some people in power feel to listen to those kinds of community-driven efforts. Um, the alderman at the time was Will Burns. He went back and forth with folks, first met with them, then stopped meeting with them. Um, and it's just really difficult after a while to really feel like you can be heard in, in Chicago in general, but especially when it comes to schools, and especially if you're poor and black. With regards to that democracy, you also, um, you spend a lot of time researching um, the, the hearing and the meeting transcripts and the public meetings that the district had um, to take public feedback. Do you, do you not consider that sort of a, a form of democracy or allowing that process to play out and letting the public be involved as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So the thing about the, so uh, for those that aren't familiar, when legally when you announce that you're going to close a school, you have to have these public hearings and forums. Um, now, the question is, what is the nature of the process and where does that feedback go? So the way these forums are held, and I talk about this extensively in the book, is that it begins, they're overseen by a judge, by an Illinois judge, and every meeting begins with the legal team from Chicago Public Schools coming in and explaining with a slideshow of test scores why the school is going to be closed. And at that point, any member of the community who wants to speak has two minutes to give testimony. You have to sign up in advance. Um, I have seen people being removed crying off a microphone after their two minutes is up. They're very strict about this. And it's very unclear. Um, and also, if you ask any questions during that period, the CPS folks are not allowed to answer. So they are only supposed to be collecting information. If somebody says, where did you get these numbers from? Or can you address this discrepancy in the number of empty buildings? Um, they're not able to respond. And then there's no clear, what happens after that is that the, the judge who's presiding over the process makes a recommendation, a non-binding recommendation to the board as to um, whether the school should be closed. And all of the books that I talk, all of the schools that I talk about in that chapter of the book, in, in every single one, coincidentally, this is not like the criterion that I selected on, coincidentally in every single one of those cases, the judge recommended that the school not be closed for a variety of reasons and they were closed anyway. And so it's the, the word process is a, is a word that I think about and write about a lot. In this case, the process is very opaque and it's very unclear. Um, you know, I think that it would be great if we continue to have these kinds of open forums, but only if there's a clear pathway where it's understood that there's a, a protocol in place to hear people, to record what they're actually saying, to listen, and to be nimble and flexible, and not just to do it sort of as a pro forma thing after the fix is in. In the book, you, um, and I also want you guys to know you will have the chance to ask questions later on as well, because I, I can hear you all thinking, so. Um, <laughs> just getting mad, and I just, <laughs> no, just, just all simmering. Excited. It's all right, I've got like a ton of questions, but I might have to come to you guys soon. Um, in the book, you also ask the question, why do people fight for schools that are deemed failing? Mm -hmm. Why? So I think that uh, another kind of recurring theme in the book is this idea of goodness and what makes a good school. And this seems like such a simple question, right? But it's actually, to me, it's sort of like the fundamental question of American public schooling that people have been trying to answer for a couple hundred years now. And the answer is always responsive to the people in question, the time in which we live, the society in which we live, right? So during the Cold War, what a good school meant largely was a school that's going to prepare us to, to beat the Russians, right? Uh, at the beginning, at the dawn of American democracy, a good school was a school that was going to teach people what it meant to participate as citizens. Um, during the first wave of, of big immigration uh, from Europe in the beginning of the, uh, of the 20th century, when folks were coming in from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe into cities, a good school was supposed to teach them English, teach their parents English, and socialize them into kind of Anglo-Saxon American culture. 
culture. So this is always like a, a culturally contested question. And um, in the last decade and a half or so, we live in this era of accountability where the answer to what is a good school is supposed to be really simple. A good school is a school that performs exceedingly well and consistently on a series of standardized tests. That's the answer, right? That is the presupposition upon which we base all of our policy and so on, um, which becomes really complicated when you know, for example, the direct correlation between income and standardized test performance. It becomes really complicated when we have public school districts that are funded by property taxes, right? It becomes really complicated when schools are often the only institutions that are facing some of our most pervasive societal problems. Kids come to school bearing the scars of the opioid crisis, bearing the scars of their parents' unemployment, bearing the scars of mental health cl uh, clinics that have been closed across the city. Schools are where we look those kids in the face and say, you have a place here, right? And so the question of what is a good school, answering it just in terms of standardized test scores becomes really complicated when that's the reality. And so I think that what it comes down to is uh, that one person's failing school by one metric for somebody else is, is the last stable institution in their life. It might be the one place where they feel loved and where they get meals every day. And that doesn't mean that those two realities can't coexist, but I think we need to begin the conversation by understanding that those are two realities and, and they're both very real. Thank you. So in this book, I appreciate that you walk us through this, this history lesson, which I found very useful in, because as not a Chicagoan who's covered CPS for the last three, four years, there was a piece that you kind of, a blank you filled in for me. I was like, oh, now I get it. It kind of makes sense. Thank Nobody you. had quite made this clear. Um, you talk about the high-rise housing developments that only accepted families and, and big families at that, families with large amounts of children and denying um, admission to people who maybe didn't have children. So then you end up with these high rises that have a ton of kids. Yes, thousands. Of, Robert Taylor homes were 28 buildings with 4,400 units in them each. What Not people, that? units. Units, mm -hmm. which means you could have subdivided units with a lot of families in them, am mm -hmm. I right? Um, so this crams a lot of children in that area. First, before we get to like their education, what, is, what does that mean for children, as you're a sociologist, what does that mean for children, you know, socially and emotionally? Well, um, you know, I, the, the thing you said first, which is that, you know, you didn't know this history. I think a lot of people don't know this history. I didn't know it until I started digging into it. And I think that um, it's intentional that many of us don't know the histories of the institutions that we operate in most frequently every day. And we're supposed to sort of take it for granted that things have always been the way they are, right? And so Chicago is the way it is today because people made it that way. Our city has a history, our CPS has a history. And as you're pointing out, um, a lot of that history has to do with public housing. And so um, this is like a long, wonky part of the book, but the, the very short version of it is that uh, part of the, so the book focuses on Bronzeville, which has had seen waves of school closures even before 2013. And there was an exceptionally high concentration of children in Bronzeville, which is about two and a half square miles. Thousands and thousands and thousands of kids uh, living in a very small space. And they didn't live there by accident, right? They lived there because of segregation. They lived there because of actual policies that were enforced not only by the Chicago Housing Authority, but also by Chicago Public Schools. Um, I talk in the book about um, double shift schedules, right? Some of you in the audience may remember this or have experienced it. CPS schools for black children were so crowded that they would have kids attend school for half a day, go home, and the other half of the kids come for the second half of the day. So if you grew up in Chicago in the 1960s or 50s and you're black, you might have had half the instructional time as your white peers in other parts of the city. And Ben Willis, who uh, is uh, Barbara Bird Bennett's predecessor of about five decades, um, not a very popular person among black Chicagoans of the 60s, uh, he was a superintendent and he said, segregation in CPS is a circumstantial thing. That was the quote, that was the phrase that he used, right? This just happened. We don't have legal segregation in the North, right? This is after Brown v. Board. If it's segregated, it's because it just so happens to be that way. Even as they were forbidding black kids from transferring into other schools in other parts of the city, which is why the Department of Justice ruled in 1980 that yes, indeed, CPS was segregating kids. Um, and so, you know, to your question of what is this like for children, I think that this gives you a very clear idea as a child of what people think of you, how you're valued. I think growing up around lots of kids is not inherently a bad thing, right? And if anything, 
it, I think that um, a silver lining you could almost think of is that folks in this part of the city have a really intense sense of community. You can drive by where the Ida B. Wells homes or Robert Taylor homes used to be in the summer and see people having public housing reunions, right? See people literally sitting in lawn chairs in a circle around where public housing used to be and, and sharing that collectivity that they still have. Um, but it definitely, uh, it was a city sending a very dastardly message to kids about how much they matter. And it also meant, you know, children are growing up on the 20-something floor, right. far from the playground and or where an adult, a parent, guardian, whatever, is keeping an eye on them. Absolutely. Or, um, you, so you touched on it just a little bit um, about their educations and what that meant. I mean, we end up with, you know, kind of the Willis Wagons that some people in this audience are, are familiar with. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, in the half days, what was school like for them? Well, I think that... Uh, I think that students got a very clear message about what keeping keeping black people in their place, right? Literally and metaphorically, saying that this is where you are and this is where you're going to stay. Um, and you know, we have this incredible history of struggle and organized resistance in the city. And so there were parents, there were folks at the Urban League and the NAACP really pushing and arguing during this time. Parents who would literally show up in schools, uh, in white schools, and show up in the office and say, "I'm here to enroll my child," and would be turned away by the police, um, parents who laid down in their in their dirt in the ground um, to try to prevent more Willis wagons, which were those uh, outdoor aluminum aug auxil auxiliary mobile school units. As well. Aluminum mobile school units is what they were technically called. These were um, in lieu of letting black kids go to other schools or, or adding on they would attend school in these trailers, which by the way are still in use in many parts of the city, particularly in Latinx communities on the, on the southwest side of the city. Kids are going to school in those trailers, right? I've been inside them. Um, and so that's important. The history isn't, isn't even past, right? Um, but I think that it's, it's the same history of struggle and resistance that we've seen for a long time. And that is why when we get up to 2013, you know, I didn't set out saying I want to write this book that starts 100 years ago, but it's important to understand that context because by the time you get to 2013 and CPS is saying, you know, trust us, this is our process, there's a lot of trust, there's a lot of mistrust, right? And there's a very deep foundation of mistrust. And when people ask me how CPS can move forward from this, I always say, you know, this isn't just about this one incident. In fact, it's not about this one incident at all. It's about a foundation of segregation and racism and the mistrust that has been built as an edifice over that foundation. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to that person. <laughs> So then the plan for transformation is born, those high rises come down, many families are displaced, mm -hmm. suddenly these schools are empty. Right, right. So the plan for transformation, um, which was supposed to be done in 2010, it's now 2018, 18. right? Skin 30 on 2018. Um, She's not wearing a watch. I was a middle record. school teacher, so I really like making the skin 30 joke. That really flies with 11 year olds. Uh, they love that one. What time is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, that's really what made me so mad <laughs> in the beginning, was, which was the, the conversation. So when Barbara Bird Bennett came out and said, we have to close these schools because we have an underutilization crisis. That was the phrase that was used, right? And the thing about crises is that they don't exist until you name them, right? And all of a sudden, the underutilization crisis became the thing that was to blame for all kinds of problems. It, you can, I, and I quote her in the book, or you can watch it on YouTube. She said, you know, we have these low graduation rates, and we don't have art in schools, and it's because of the underutilization crisis. And the reason she gave for this crisis, which of course was that the buildings were underutilized, meaning you have very large capacity buildings with very low enrollment. By the way, CPS lost 10,000 kids in the last year. We just found that Numbers out. Numbers that this we just week. found out Friday afternoon. Um, and so this is going to continue happening, right? And we need a sustainable solution to it. The, the reason she gave was that she said underutilized schools on the south and west sides are a result of uh, demographic change and not race, was the phrase that she used, which is a paradox because. <laughs> This is a paradox, right? So, um, so the situation we're in. So, 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 you know what happened was this. So, um, so that 
irritated me because, you know, we now talk about what's something that's so frustrating about this presidency is that, um, you know, you can be looking at a picture with three people in a crowd and having to hear a deranged person tell you how there were a thousand people in the crowd, right? And after, you can only take so much of this. And so, but um, in Chicago, we've had that okie doke for a very long time. And so uh, Barbara Bird Bennett said, you know, black people just left. We don't know where the kids went. You know, the schools are just empty because reasons, you know, and uh, that, that made me mad because the plan for transformation is not ancient history. I did not go and do an archeological dig, to, right? This is 1999, this is 1999. And so to look people in the face, to get in on a public platform and, and act like these schools are empty, when we just saw the photos of the buildings coming down that have been there for generations, like we didn't all read the same newspaper, is, is insulting. And um, it's, 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 you know, I'm happy with the book, but it's also a little silly that I had to spend a lot of time basically writing down what people on the South Side already knew and that nobody uh, gave them the credibility to just believe them or the power to just say something or do something about it until you know, I had to go in the library and write down how many kids were living there, right? And I think that that's a little silly. We have to talk about racism. Say again? Racism. Oh yeah, all day. We have to talk right, about racism. Yeah, yeah. I thought we Stand were by. talking about racism. <laughs> <laughs> you mean what? Well, what were you doing? Yeah. That's all I talk about, Brandis. <laughs> So, um, I'm skipping around. I'm Just super kidding. excited. I I've got like other things. <laughs> I've got a lot of TV. questions, and so I'm organizing okay. myself here because there's one that I want to get to. So we keep mentioning Barbara Bird Bennett, who everybody knows about Barbara Bird Bennett. Mm -hmm. So you know the part where she's in federal prison, okay? Which for you know I don't cheer for that because I don't believe in prison, but I do. I do have questions about. Um, well, you know, I hope that. I hope the bird in her name is, is not just a metaphor and I hope she sings, you know? Um, because it's really interesting to have a black woman take the fall. I mean, she is very guilty. Like she did what she is in prison for doing. She is absolutely very guilty. She pleaded guilty in federal court. Right, for, she's uh, very guilty. Fraud. But um, the schools are still closed, right? And that's not a decision that she orchestrated on her own. Um, and so I wonder where the accountability is for that, but that's neither here nor there. Sounds like some investigation needs to happen there. But mm -hmm. <laughs> on that note, I want to, we call her B3, just as mm -hmm. education reporters. It's just easier than saying all three of her names. But I wanted to share with you all, for those of you who haven't read the book, something that she said. Um, this is a direct quote from Eve's book of uh, what Barbara Bird Bennett said. To refuse to challenge the status quo that is failing thousands of African-American students year after year, she said, quote, consigning them to, I see yeah, you thinking, consigning them to a future with less opportunities than other. Now that's what I call racist. I grew up and went to school in an overwhelming African-American community where the schools were underutilized and under-resourced. So believe me, I know what racism is and what racism is not. Mm -hmm. Two things, your reaction, but also in the book, you, you eloquently explain why you believe that, that the closures were in fact racist. Yeah, so um, that, that passage that you read uh, was really like a catalyst for me in, in wanting to take on this project. So there, there are a couple of claims that she's basically making there, right? Um, the first is that the status quo is the empty schools and if you keep kids in the schools, now that's what I call racist, right? Um, she's, she is effectively re-weaponizing the language of the civil rights movement by redefining what racism is, right? Racism is doing what I tell you racism is, right? And it also makes very convenient use of her position as a black woman, and that is an, an intentional political tactic, right? That is intentional because when, when people then responded to this and said the school closings are racist, the, the quote that the mayor gave to all the newspapers was, how can you say that? That's so insulting to Barbara, right? So he effectively skirts any kind of structural analysis, any kind of discussion of the impact of the policy that he is behind by pointing at the black woman who's, who's in charge. And, you know, it's like a Carl Rovian level of, of political manipulation, quite frankly. Um, and the second thing is her saying, you know, I know what racism is and what racism is not, right? I was in Detroit last week and I gave a talk um, in Detroit, and when I got to a slide with a picture of her face, the people in Detroit were like started flipping chairs, right? They're like, oh, 
And these people were shocked. They said, y'all gave Barbara Burr Bennett a job? She spent time in Detroit. <laughs> y'all gave her a job? She spent time in Detroit she as well, for clarity. She was the chief academic accountability officer of Detroit Public Schools. And she jacked them up, right? And the people that, the people that she was getting the kickbacks from, uh, which landed her in, in prison, which I have to they always in say, as well. my, my favorite quote, which was she, her email said, um, I have tuition to pay and casinos to visit. Um, so you know she's not from Chicago because when we do corruption and crimes, we use a payphone. We don't email people, you know. On you the, don't email people email like account. on your CPS account like, hey, send me the bribes by Friday. Do like, you have the money? Uh, send me the bribes. No, don't, you, that's not a good look. But, um, but those were her people from Detroit, right? And this is um, Paul Vallis, same deal. Paul Vallis goes from Chicago to Philly to New Orleans, right? These people are school reform carpetbaggers. And they go from place to place, and they have the same uh, algorithm of, of destruction that they, that they utilize in these different places. And they play into a political ideology that crosses both sides of the aisle. It's one of the few things I think that Democrats and Republicans in this country can really get together on and have for years. Democrats and Republicans in this country have so many beliefs about the way you use punishment and control and sanctions to improve our schools, right? Um, by using this kind of market logic that you're gonna punish the bad ones and reward the good ones and everybody will fight it out. Well, while you're fighting it out, there are kids in these buildings, right? Um, and also, these policies are never at play when it's their own kids, right? None of these folks send their kids to a school where uh, punishment is considered an adequate response to somebody not being able to read, for instance, right? And where sanctioning and taking resources away are considered a, a reasonable response. And so, um, yeah, that whole quote just made me so mad. It got her going. Made me so like, mad I wrote a book about it. Do more it. quotes. I know. <laughs> yeah. I should read more quotes from B3. Um, so let's talk about the relationship that families, and, and you get into this in the book a, a lot as well, the relationship that families and students have with that school. Because you say the district used, you know, test scores, and these schools are failing um, to make the case for closure. Um, and the consortium at the University of Chicago has done some research on where the students from the closed schools ended up and how parents made choices about where to send their, their mm -hmm. students because they didn't always choose the welcoming school that um, CPS suggested as, you know, to, the, to be the welcoming school. Um, and the research shows parents don't choose their schools based on the district's quality rating. What is, what do they choose based on? Yeah, oh, you asked me like three questions. I want to answer all of them. So Sorry. Uh, that's okay. So, so the choice thing. So um, Mary Patillo, who's right here in Northwestern, has done some really great research on the way black parents in, on the South Side engage in this choice process that CPS has put out. Now, the, the way school choice in this like portfolio model is supposed to work, I, I often compare it to shopping for cereal, right? So you go down the cereal aisle, you're like, yeah, I kind of like the Crunch Berries, but I kind of like the Cocoa Krispies. Let me look at the nutrition facts, right? You flip it around, you look at the data, and you make an informed decision about which cereal you would like to purchase. And this is sort of the model by which um, we are presuming that parents are making these choices. They know their kid, they know what their kid wants, and they're supposed to go look at all the data and pick the best school for them. Now, there are a number of problems with this. Um, number one, many people in Chicago are poor right? Um, that has a lot of ripple effects in terms of how you are actually able to enact choice. If you have, if you don't have a car, for instance, it makes it very difficult to get certain places. If you have an inflexible work schedule, if you do not live in a place that you feel is safe, where your child is going to be crossing between gang boundaries, which was one of the biggest concerns that many parents brought up before the school closures, and Darion Albert, who was brutally murdered after his high school was closed and consolidated, his mother came out and said, if you do this, more children are gonna die the way my son died. Right? We did it anyway. Um, there are so many practical things that uh, when you are living in, a, in the precarious situation that so many low-income Chicagoans are living in, that makes it really difficult to make these ideal choices. I interviewed one former student for uh, the book, and um, I asked her you know, about her high school. I said, why did you go to this high school? And she said, I always wanted to go to Dunbar. 
Right, Dunbar's on King Drive around like 31st Street. I always wanted to go to Dunbar because they have a pre-medical program and I really want to be a doctor. It's what I really want to do. And I, I dreamed about Dunbar. I applied to Dunbar. I got into Dunbar. And on the first day of school, my mom was late for work. And she told me, I have to take your brother to school. He goes to the neighborhood school. I'm just going to drop you off there just for today. Just for today. It's her neighborhood school, so they have to take her. This kid shows up on the first day, not registered, no class schedule, and the neighborhood school takes her in. And that's the school she graduated from four years later, right? That's not school choice. That's a parent making a decision based on whatever the constraints were of their life. And, and as a result, the kid doesn't get to go to the school that she wants. Now, we don't have the kind of high pressure um, cooker situation we have in Chicago with high schools. I used to teach eighth grade. And, and the worst day as an eighth grade teacher uh, is the Monday after everybody gets their high school acceptance letters. Worst day. Worst day. These kids come in. And they are devastated, and it's very difficult to understand to explain the process of school of school choice to a 12 or 13 year old kid who, up until this point, pretty much knows the 59 other people that they're in school with that they've been with since kindergarten. And other, it's not like this in other places because if you live in a wealthy district where all the schools are good, it's just not that big of a deal, right? It's just not that big of a deal. And um, so this process, you know, I think that it's important for people to have choices, but I also think that sometimes the idea of choice distracts us from our obligation to make sure that every single school is a great school so that it doesn't feel like a life or death decision. So it, with regard to like the school closures, do you see was there an alternative? What should the district have done differently? Are they doing better today? <laughs> We're coming to you. Uh, for those on the live stream, the audience says no. Um, so I think, number one, I don't pretend that these are easy decisions. That's why I don't work in CPS. I'm a professor, right? I make very simple decisions every day. Um, so I don't pretend that there are any perfect answers. I do think that the first thing that would have been really helpful is having an honest conversation about history um, and, and not insulting us with this kind of ahistorical analysis that I talked about earlier. I think the second thing is having a genuine participatory process. And I don't mean a process that you just trot out when it's time to close the schools and you need to do the bare legal minimum. I mean genuine routes for people to participate, to understand that their voice matters, to be heard, right? And for that to become, I, I would like to see a Chicago where that becomes built into the fabric of CPS in the long term, right? Um, where, where we are accustomed to understanding that our voices can be heard. And these processes exist. These are, there are people that are very skilled at, at holding really meaningful participatory processes for community budgeting and all kinds of other things and that people have used at very large scales. But we also have a trust problem. And the trust problem, you know, one of my mentors, Charles Payne, um, who's a Chicago education legend, um, he has a book where he tells a, a, a parable of the pot of gold where somebody comes into a public school and they say, I'm here to give everybody a pot of gold, right? And all the teachers say, well, how much gold did the, street, the, the school up the street get, right? Are we getting the same amount of gold? And, and well, how are we going to distribute? Did you talk to the union about the gold? And, you know, we tried gold 10 years ago, and it just didn't work. We've, we've, we've done gold before. You know, gold may have worked in Evanston, but it's not going to work in our school. And... That, that sounds like people um, are being irrational, but when you live in a climate where you are constantly lied to and constantly degraded, um, as teachers and students and, and parents in many of these schools are, um, being mistrustful is the height of rationality. Actually, you would be a fool to believe anything that CPS tells you, right, if you've been lied to for generations. And so I think that much larger than anything else, we need to think really critically about what it looks like to build trust in our district in big ways and small. You know, I, was, I always say, like, start out, like, maybe we just redo the menus for all the cafeterias, right? And everybody in Chicago, it's not a serious thing. It's not a, a life or death thing. Let's just talk about what kind of food we want to eat, and let's let everybody participate in the process. What, what does it look like to practice and to model real participatory processes? And I think that that's a Chicago problem. That's not just a CPS problem. But I would love it if CPS could take leadership and teach the rest of Chicago what it means to really live in a democratic city. 
I was waiting on it. <laughs> um, we could talk about schools a whole lot more, but I want to talk about a couple of things, and then we are going to come to you all for your questions, because I'm sure you've got some awesome ones. Um, only ask me the awesome ones. It's only the me. awesome ones. The not so awesome <laughs> ones. You have to keep them to yourself. You have to write those in your diary. Um, we have to talk about Ironheart. You guys are familiar. There you go. You were not shy. So I brought some tweets because you guys know she oh, tweets. Oh, don't read those. Okay, okay. I won't okay. read the tweets unless, <laughs> unless it's okay. Well, you um, can, sure. <laughs> so she was not shy. You weren't shy about going after um, the job, getting the gig to, to write Ironheart. Um, and, the, and the tweets are all funny, but like she's just making <laughs> it clear you. that because she's funny, but the tweets are just making it clear, by the way, you guys, like, doesn't she look like Riri Williams, <laughs> and why did you want to go after that? Okay, so, um, so for those who don't know, I'm writing a comic book for Marvel called Ironheart, and it comes out um, November 28th, um, and I'm very, thank you, <laughs> I'm very excited about it, and Ironheart, um, her, her alter ego is, is a black teen girl from Chicago named Riri Williams. Um, now, the reason I'm mortified about people reading the tweets is because... Um, they're on Twitter, you can find they're, them. They're on Twitter, you can find them. <laughs> so what happened was, uh, uh, the, the person, the writer who created this character, his name is Brian Michael Bendis, and it was announced that he was leaving Marvel. And... Um, the uh, somebody on a podcast asked this question of the Twitterverse, like who should write this, right? And somebody put my name forward, and people were like, oh yeah, you know. And someone's like, well, she looked, they look the same, right? Now I want people to understand very clearly. I did not, in any realm of the universe, think that Marvel was going to ever hire me to do anything. Okay, I am the fifth black woman in history since 1961 to write for Marvel Comics, okay? So you can clap, but it also sucks. Like, that's also terrible, right? And I'm the fourth to write in print. Um, so one of those five is digital. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter, you know that I frequently say very lighthearted things. For instance, I'm also leading a campaign for the mayoral election of the CTA platform heater, um, which I think is the most reliable Chicagoan. <laughs> is always there for us. It's there when it says it's gonna be there. It keeps you warm. It keeps you warm in the winter. You know? So that, that is, I have, I have been campaigning for this for years, okay? So, so everything I say on Twitter is not serious. <laughs> um, and I, I ended up, I am actually, I love comics and I've dreamed about writing comics my whole life. But for me, saying that I thought I was going to write for comics is like saying that I thought I was going to be on the Olympic water polo team. Like, saying I was going to write for Marvel. I always thought that I would put out, that I would self-publish an independent comic book or that I would do some, like, web comics or cartooning. Always thought I would do that. But, um, like, NASA, like, these are the, this is the level of dreaming that we're talking about here. Like, maybe one day I'll write for Marvel and I'll also be an astronaut. These are not these things reasonable <laughs> as you get to a certain age, right? And so... Um, so shockingly, it's something that I really get to do. But the thing is, Brandis, I get on the internet every day and I talk about racism and America and all this stuff. That's all fine and good. The level of racism, vitriol, and harassment in the comics community is above and beyond anything I've ever experienced in my life. And I have gotten more attacks and harassment for writing a fictional character who shoots a laser blaster from her hand uh, because I am a black woman and because people don't think that this is something that black women should be doing, I have gotten more harassment for that than anything I've ever said about the president or the mayor. And so, and many of these people truly believe that I was hired by Marvel because I look like Riri Williams, which is very insulting because I have written two books, a play, two forthcoming children's books. I have a doctorate from Harvard University, right? Like I have, she's a real slouch yeah. and has no business writing comics. Right. I have, I've done things, right? And this is the same, um, it's very high profile, but it's the same logic that people use against my parents and my grandparents, right? You were hired because you were black and you're not qualified to do this. And um, so, so I always cringe a little bit because while for us it's very lighthearted, and I truly was joking, I never, ever, 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 and to be clear, I was not hired for my haircut, I wrote a pitch 
and had meetings and revised a lot of things and have a proven track record as a writer, right? That is why I was hired for Marvel Comics. And I uh, have a lot of opportunities for them to fire me, and they have not yet, right? Because I, I've turned in a lot of work. It's a very long process, and I um, had to fight for my place at the table like anybody else would. And so um, it's just, it's really interesting that, that uh, this thing that for us is, is very lighthearted is um, something that is genuinely used against me by people who truly in their heart think that a multi-million dollar company uh, hires black people because they just showed up and asked for the job. Um, which I don't know where they do that at, but, uh, but, but Marvel ain't it, you guys. <laughs> um, but everybody should buy the comic book and read it. November. It's really good. <laughs> November 28th, right? Yes, All November right. 28th. And I'll be doing a signing December 1st in Chicago. Note to self, mark your calendar now. Um, I think are we okay to take questions from the audience? All right, so um, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. Thank you, gentlemen. And we are yes, not sir. choosing people, the person with yes, the Yes, our friend Kate yes. has the microphone, so I'm gonna ask you to please yes. wait until Kate makes it over to you so that you're not yelling so that everybody can hear First your question. question. right here. Professor Ewing, I know you Hi. can't give a, a detailed answer, but could you list some of the things that need to happen to undo all of this great harm that's been done to the Chicago Public Schools? Oh, boy. Um, some of the things, well, one, we need an elected representative school board. That's an easy one. Uh, when, you know, when the mayor is um, told this, uh, he says that we shouldn't have an elected school board because it might become too political. <laughs> to which I say, uh, when Deborah Quazo was found to be, who was a Chicago uh, Board of Ed member, was found to be giving uh, contracts for her company to CPS Schools, her educational technology company. And there's a rule in, um, in the board that if, you, if, if a bid is like a certain amount of money, like $25,000, the board has to discuss it. And so she was giving out these bids with these bizarre discounts to keep them just under $25,000. So people were getting like, you get 12 points. 0.7% off on your uh, bill. Um, so that to me is political, right? A board member making money off of their position as a board of ed member is political. And also, um, like, let me at least vote for my terrible, corrupt representative. You don't get to pick, even if they're terrible and they do a bad job, at least let me have some. So that's, that's the first thing, is we need an elected representative school board. Um, the second thing is, um, the next election, the mayoral election, is a really pivotal moment, and I think we all know that. And I think that regardless of, of who you vote for, um, we need to demand more of, of the person who leads the city because they have tremendous power. Much of it, as I mentioned, is autocratic power. And we need to demand more for all Chicagoans. The tale of two cities metaphor has been said so many times that it's a cliche, but it's true. The level of wealth and concentration of, of privilege and property and people that have in this city coexisting alongside the level of poverty and struggle and unemployment and utter lack of resources happening at the exact same time is shocking. It's morally reprehensible and it makes it morally reprehensible for us to be having any conversation about Amazon or a train that takes you to O'Hare in five minutes. You know, this is, this is basic stuff. And I think that we need, um, you know, I don't like militaristic metaphors, so I don't, I don't wanna say a war on poverty, but we need to talk seriously about the poverty in this city. We need to talk seriously about the lack of affordable housing and the role that a lot of the development that the mayor has shepherded in is having on that lack of affordable housing. Folks are leaving Chicago because they can't afford to live here. And because it, 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 we, that is why we are hemorrhaging kids from our school district, right? That is the canary in the coal mine. We are losing folks because they can not afford to live here. And I want to live in a Chicago, I want to raise children in a Chicago that is for everybody and that shares the, the wealth and the joy and the beauty and all the wonderful, amazing assets we have for everybody. Um, but I think we need to have a serious conversation about poverty before we can do any of that. And there's any number of, of great um, interventions and people doing phenomenal work in the city, whether it's youth summer jobs, whether it's mentorship, whether it's uh, transitions for people who are 
coming out of being incarcerated. We have all of the resources at our disposal and people who work here doing incredible work to, to really tackle this, um, but we have to have the moral will to do it. Kate is coming with the microphone. Right That's why we should all vote for the CTA heater for mayor. No, I'm just kidding. CTA heater CTA for mayor. CTA heater for mayor. I wonder if you could talk to us about your view of the role of charter schools in what's happened. Yeah, that's a great question um, that I get asked a lot. So the question was about what is the role of charter schools. So um, in 1999, 2000, Mayor Daley announced uh, Renaissance 2010, which was supposed to bring 100 new schools to Chicago in 10 years. I don't know why everybody thought that the span of time between 2000 and 2010 was when we would like fix everything. Like, and it's the new millennium zeitgeist where it's like we're going to tear down all the public housing, we're going to build all the new schools. Um, but as you know. All of the charter schools that, were, that have been built and constructed during that time have played a role in, in this ecosystem, um, frequently draining kids from neighborhood schools. Now, I think it's really important, something I say all the time is that every parent's job is to choose the school that is best for their child. That is a parent's job. A parent's job is to do what is best for their kid. And whether that's a charter school or a private school or home school or boarding school, I don't begrudge anybody that decision. That is your job. A policymaker's job is to do what is best for all children. And that means that making sure that all schools have the resources that they need. Now, because we have per pupil funding in CPS, which means that you, we do the magical count on the 20th day, and you get your funding based on the number of, of seats, uh, butts and seats is, is the term of art, um, that means that neighborhood schools are really struggling. And I think that um, it's, it's easy to blame charter schools for that, and I, but I think that, again, the question becomes what are policymakers really doing to look carefully at the ecosystem and say what role can charters play and how is this going to be sustainable or not. A lot of charter schools are also being closed in the last several years as well, which to me is even worse because it's one thing if you have a school that's been around for 50 years and now you're saying, okay, we're gonna close it, but if you just approved somebody's charter like five years ago and now you're, you're closing them because you don't have an adequate building for them, what does that reveal about the level of planning that, that you put in, right? Um, and I think that uh, also Chicago is poised to potentially have the first ever charter school teacher strike in the nation. Um, there are 19, 19 charter schools uh, where teachers are saying, you know what, we want to do things for our kids. We want to not work 60 hours a week. Uh, we want to have the resources that we need to support our children. We want to not have these punitive discipline measures where we're suspending and expelling kids or where we're charging kids for detention, right? Nobles taking like $130,000 of suspension and detention fees from families. Um, and so I think that that's really going to be a moment uh, where many folks in charter schools are saying, you know, we are part of this bigger conversation about what educational justice is going to look like. So, um, so yes, charter schools played a role. They are also part of why these schools are, are under-enrolled, but I think it's a much bigger picture. Kate's coming. Over here to the She's, she's, she's running. She's, she's, she's getting her me. steps I'm in so today. Sorry. It's okay. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. My question is about the local school councils. Oh, great question. What role could they be playing in, um, I don't want to say renovating, but uh, reforming and making sustainable policy that will benefit all the kids in CPS? I love an LSC question. I will slide you your check later. Um, <laughs> So currently the local school council is the only form of democratic representative governance we have in CPS. Um, every single school has a local school council. Um, I once, for fun, uh, made a spreadsheet of all the LSC elections and all of the uncontested community representative spots just because I wanted to see like how many there were, and there are lots. So. Um, 
Every single person, if you live within the attendance boundary of a CPS school, which you do, if you live in the city of Chicago, you are eligible to run as a community representative for your local school council. You do not have to have a child in the school. Um, in high school, students can also run for LSEs. Um, and uh, I've served on the LSC. It's an amazing way to, it's an amazing and very accessible way to understand how budgeting works in schools and to really get an up close and personal understanding of how school governance works and how CPS governance, governance works. Um, and I think that, you know, unfortunately LSCs have been, have been really stripped of a lot of their power um, in recent years, but they still make a difference and make decisions. And I really encourage everybody to, you know, think about running for LSC at some point. If you're a parent or a teacher or a community member, um, you can do it. And I, I think people should step up. And I think it's, an, it's another way that regular Chicagoans can demonstrate our investment, that these are our schools, these are all of our schools, um, and we need to act like it. Thank you. So Kate, I'm not sure, I don't know how much time we've got for more questions. We've got time for one more question. Time for okay. one more question. One we have one in the balcony, but I don't know how we'd throw a microphone up there. Um, if balcony, catch. Okay. I'll, I will let we you need just balcony yell it representation. Out. Okay, I'll let great. you yell it out, balcony. Well, me? Okay. Um, I am a former CPS teacher, which is why it's called near me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a former CPS librarian. Yay! Because I was blacklisted. I was in one of the two north sides. What do we do? How do we get people up north? So, um, I'm going to just repeat briefly the question. Um, so the the question, the the person asking the question is a current librarian, former librarian, former teacher at Trumbull, which is one of the few schools on the north side that was closed. It's in Uptown, um, and a former librarian and former teacher who really had trouble finding employment after the school closures. And speaking specifically from the perspective of Trumbull as a school serving special needs students, which by the way is one of the ways in which this underutilization formula fails, right? Because if you are a special needs student, you have legally protected rights regarding the ratio of, of adults to children and people that are working with you. Um, it's almost as if uh, packing kids into a classroom efficiently is not the most important educational virtue. Um, <laughs> for some reason. Go figure. Um, so the question was, how do we really motivate all Chicagoans to go out and vote and step up for every election? Um, that is a great question. And I, I'm not going to pretend that I have the answer. Um, I do want to say that I think, you know, we began this conversation by talking a lot about segregation. And segregation plays a really big role in this. Um, so Chicago is about a third white. And um, I would have to rerun these numbers now that we have the new attendance numbers, but as of last year, CPS is about 9% to 10% white. Um, and most of those students are congregated in selective enrollment schools, um, schools on the northwest side, gifted schools, and so on. So there's, a, there's disproportionately high representation in, in those schools. And what that means is that the majority of white families in Chicago have divested from CPS. They have opted out. Um, and, you know, I just came from saying that people should make the best decisions that they need to make for their kids, right? Um, but when it happens across the city on a large scale, you have to start asking questions about what are we doing to care for our neighbors and to understand that the public resources that we all share and that we all pay for are something that we all have a responsibility for. Um, and. I think that, you know, there's all kinds of statistics about, uh, you know, not having friends of color, not having people of color in everyday life. Um, and I think that those are all the ways that segregation comes down in a really vicious way because it means that when you see the headline about a school closure, it's about those kids, right? Those kids over there. And part of uh, the thing that uh, B3 said that made me so mad was that um, she said, you know, these schools are underutilized and under-resourced. Your job is to give out the resources. That's your job. You're gonna close a school because it doesn't have enough resources and that's your job? And I feel that that plays on a stereotype of what people think a CPS school is, what it looks like, and who's in there. And teachers, all the teachers in the room know that stereotype because every time you tell somebody you're a public school teacher, they say, oh, bless you. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, it's like, it's not that serious. You know, you're, oh, you're a saint, you know, and it's like, that's a compliment, but you're also basically admitting that you think my kids are monsters, 
right? You think I'm Mother Teresa for going to school every day. And so I think that um, I think that in order to really have a city where people feel ownership, where people understand that this matters, we need to talk about segregation. We need to talk about racism in the city. We need to understand that Laquan McDonald was somebody's child, right? And was a CPS student. And we need to break down some of these stereotypes and some of these assumptions about who public school kids are and who public schools are for. And also vote for your alder goon, your alder person. <laughs> We've got a number of elections coming up, so. Yes. Um, I think we're out of time for questions. Please join me in thanking Dr. Thank Ewing. Thank you all for so much. Our...